<laughs> you delightful little marketing bees. You're tuned into episode 51 of the Marketing Buzzword Podcast. This is the Marketing Buzzword Podcast, the podcast where we dissect the world's most common marketing buzzwords. Hold on tight. We are about to fly around the beehive to see the latest buzzwords that stuck to the marketing bees. Hello again, and welcome back to the Marketing Buzzword Podcast. This is the podcast which helps you to understand what all these business and marketing buzzwords actually mean and how they can be helpful or not going forward. I'm your host, Ben Roberts, and in these shows, I am going to be the marketing bee in charge of making sure I get on the right guests and ask the right questions so that these marketing words and phrases actually make sense. Now, in today's show, we're going to make sense of a word that has been on my lips recently, and I know that a lot of people talk about it, and it's self-publishing. Um, and I've got the perfect guest to talk about it. But before we do that, I need to remind you this podcast is powered by Talkative. Talkative is a company that brings together live web chat, voice calling, video calling, and co-browsing embedded into your website. Essentially, allows your customers to call you through your website instead of having to pick up a phone. And you, as a company, it uh, allows them it calls on your normal phones, and you also get much more data about the customer what pages they've been on, how long they've been on your website, so you have much more context in order to be able to help them out. Find out more at talkative.uk. And then one final thing before we get on to this week's guest. If you are enjoying the show, please do leave a review on iTunes. I really, really do appreciate it. We've had a few more come in, but I know there are more of you listening that you haven't uh, left a review yet simply go on the marketing buzzword.com website and John Asperian but guest back or oh, must be like 25 episodes ago did a really cool video which on there it shows you how to easily review it on iTunes and iOS right that's more than enough about me <laughs> and the show it's time to introduce this week's guest and this week's guest is a guy who I've known for a number of years we've met a number of different conferences and this guy is He just seems to know absolutely everyone who's anyone in the sort of business and marketing space. And it's Tim Lewis. And for those of you who don't know Tim, Tim is the host of the Begin Self-Publishing Podcast and author of uh, uh, of three-time travel books, uh, um, which are fancy books. And he's also just completed his first non-fiction book called Social Media Networking. Of which I've actually pre-ordered a copy and I'm really excited to get it this month. And in this book he's going to discuss how to use social media as an individual to get ahead in your life using the new connection opportunities that it gives you. And also there is a rumour out there. There's a rumour out there if Tim Lewis doesn't come to a marketing conference it's not worth having. Some say. If those of you don't, well, yeah, could have made that more of like a Top Gear Stig reference. But hey, oh, it, 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 it's done now. Right. That's more than enough for me. Let's get on with the show. Hi, Tim, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, Ben. I'm glad to be on your show. Ah, oh, Tim, Tim, Tim. I am equally glad, if not more so, to get you on my show. <laughs> well, that's good. We're both very glad to have each other on on your show. <laughs> I feel like I feel like this has just been a perfect start. I think we could just end it there. It's been positive. It's been it's just been wonderful. Uh, this great. Thanks for listening, everyone. Yeah, drop the mic and uh, walk out, and that's the end. Of, that's the end of this episode. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I could not. I could not do that to all the listeners and sort of only only have a couple of seconds of Tim Lewis. And the reason I wanted to bring you on, Tim, today is because. You're the man who talks about self-publishing and writing books and stuff. And if the, everyone who's been listening to this podcast I know for the last month, I've been doing the crowdfunding campaign for my book, which was an idea I actually got off listening to your podcast. And I was like, well, if I want to talk about book writing, self-publishing, publishing and all sorts of stuff like that, well, I've got to, got to speak to the guy who I learned this off in the first place. Yes, I am the... Uh... <laughs> I'm the Yoda of self-publishing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, lo- I, 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 I never had you down as a Yoda, Tim. Never had you down. I think you're a bit too tall to be a Yoda. <laughs> yeah, well, it's the camera angle, you see. It's like he's actually six foot four, Yoda, and it's just uh, Luke Skywalker. It was just very, very, very tall instead. 
Yeah, yeah, and the camera angle's always always sort of looking looking exactly, up to you as yeah. well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's crack on with this, Tim, and I'm going to talk to you talk to you about publishing, self publishing, and and this sort of world because obviously this is one that I'm starting to immerse myself in a bit now with the crowdfunding campaign for my book. So why? Apart from myself, why are more and more people talking about... Right, it seems like more and more people than ever before are talking about writing a book. Now, why is that? Why is writing a book suddenly becoming such a important thing for people? Well, I mean, the number one reason why most people in the marketing space are interested in books is not about book sales. It's about credibility and being able to say that I am the person who wrote the book on sort of beekeeping marketing techniques. I'm the world authority on that. And that is where uh, having a book gives you authority. I mean, it's similar to people having podcasts, um, but there's a lot more effort required to actually write a book than create a podcast, even though a podcast is quite a lot of effort, as you and I both know. Uh, so in terms of the marketing world, um, self-publishing is very attractive as an option, mainly primarily for smaller um, marketers, like people in business business areas, but also potentially for big companies as well. I mean, they can write and publish books about a topic, and that gives credibility. So I think for the marketing perspective, that is where self-publishing is kind of quite good and i would say the reason why it's starting kind of now is that people are more and more people are realizing that they can self-publish books to a high quality where for an awful long time certainly in the uk uh, a lot less so in the us but certainly the uk there has been a bit of a stigma attached to self-publishing as if it's like something that's not not proper it's not the same as being traditionally published and I think gradually people are realising when they're exposed to self-published books that are created in a good way that actually that stigma isn't really something that people should consider. Mm. I think that's an amazing point, isn't it? I think this is one of the reasons that one of the things that I was looking at when I was looking at writing my book is whether I go with down the traditional publishing route, whether you look at some of these hybrid publishers, as they call them, you've got these indie publishers you've got self-publishing companies and you've got there's a company out there for every sort of publishing and he's trying to understand is actually look there is a a much bigger world out there now than there used to be it used to be that you had to go to a traditional or an independent publisher and now you've got a, a, a plethora of different different options there and i mean i think i'm pretty sure i've read a lot of books that you probably wouldn't even have known have been self-published because they are done to such a high quality whereas before it was would have been pretty evident that one was self-published versus one was traditionally published yeah i mean there have been i'll give your listeners a little bit of a history lesson um a lot of this change started to happen about sort of 2009 to 2012 time period uh one one thing was the introduction of the kindle device and ebooks now for self-publishers ebooks are a tremendous revenue source. Um, the actual business of having a paperback book or a hardback book is very cost intensive um, in as much as you, you, it costs a lot to produce a paperback and you only get a small amount of cut for each sale. But the paperback area has also been transformed by what's called print on demand, which was introduced around a similar kind of time. So what print on demand is, is where, say, I go to Amazon after your book is out uh, and I see, oh, Ben Roberts, and I'm going to like click on the Amazon site and order a paperback copy of your book. Now, in the old days, uh, you would have had to have gone to a printer's and printed off like 20,000 copies of your book or whatever. Probably not that many, but like 200. Let's say. <laughs> Depends how popular off, you are. Yeah, sent it off to... Amazon and they would have kept that in their warehouse and when you ordered it it would like take it and it would take one of those books and if they sold out you would have to do another print run. What print on demand is is that 
Amazon, when they receive the signal, I want to buy your book, they go to one of these basically bespoke printing, like um, printing presses that they have and they create space things and they print off a copy and then send that copy to me. So it's literally, there is no stock of the book in Amazon warehouses. They are just going to print off a copy and send it to me. And the quality of print on demand books is actually fairly good. I mean, as a compared to a traditional print run, you can kind of tell uh, if once you start looking that a book is being printed in print on demand. But it just makes so much difference to small scale publishers and the ability to self publish paperback books. So these two factors have made have transformed the the landscape of publishing. Uh, and a lot of the publishing companies are in denial about this. But if you want to create a book, basically anybody can create a book. Uh, an ebook is relatively straightforward to create, and a paperback book that is audible on Amazon or an online retailer is relatively easy to create. There are still issues if you want your book available in a bookstore. Uh, that's that's possible, but that's a lot more where the traditional publishing companies have an advantage still. Uh, but if you want your book available on Amazon to be ordered as a paperback or an ebook, then that's it almost makes more sense to go down the self-publishing route than going with a traditional publisher because you are getting all of the revenue of that and you're so much more in control of the process. Yeah, and actually you'd argue as well that how many people these days go in to buy a physical bookstore? I know for the, whether it's Barnes & Noble for the US audience, whether it's just it's for like Waterstones... I think I mean I remember used to going in. I used to go in Waterstones and Borders and places like that that sold books. And I I don't think I've actually stepped foot in one for a long time. I and mean, the only place I've <laughs> actually been in, which sells a, a large scale of books, W. H. Smith. And you know what? He wasn't to buy a book. Yeah, I mean, um, it wasn't this year. It was last year. Uh, I'm sure you've probably mentioned social media marketing world on your podcast before. A few times. Uh, I, it seems to be an, it seems to be one of those things where everyone I seem to have met has come from there at some stage. <laughs> yeah, well, in, in my book that I'm currently writing about social media networking, it was like I had to tell people, stop mentioning social media marketing world. We're just like, <laughs> I've just had it in too many of the interviews. <laughs> but anyway, after the 2017 social media marketing world, uh, I went... Uh, back via Boston because I don't like night flights so I go to places on the east coast that I can get a morning flight back to the UK and I actually um, it was the weather was terrible it was like it was snowing all the time in Boston so I was basically in the shopping centre and I saw a Barnes and Noble and I thought okay well I'll go into this Barnes and Noble store and I'll look to see how many books in the marketing section I can see from authors who are speakers at social media marketing world and there were two. So, and I know that like at least, uh, I'd say at least half the speakers at Social Media Marketing World have been traditionally published. And it's probably about 20 or 30% who are self-published books. And there were literally of this whole shelf of marketing books. So I would say about 200 books. There were two books from people who had spoken at Social Media Marketing World. And I think, I mean, it is one of the premier like marketing conferences in the world. Mm. So anybody who thinks that, like, if they're traditionally published, their book will be available in every bookstore, it is it's sadly um, they're dooted, unfortunately. There are just so much competition for that space in places like Barnes & Noble that unless you're, like going to be 50 shades of gray writer in the marketing world uh 50 shades of buzzwords <laughs> uh you're not going to be getting your book in the bookstore even if you're traditionally published so that's something to consider really if you're kind of thinking well i want to go traditionally published because i want my book to appear in bookstores it might be there for a, a couple of weeks but then they'll they'll they sell it out unless it really uh, they'll, they might even return it if it doesn't sell Mm, yeah, and that's one of those things. You look at it again. Is again, it'd be the same thing with like supermarkets and any other sort of chain of stores. Yes, they you you can supply 
say, your products to that supermarket chain, but the, your products may not appear in absolutely every single one because certain areas have different dis, diff, certain preferences. Again, you and they may be a lot more like to sell books in one area or another because they'll, they'll have all this information data to hand. So it's almost a case of action. You could end up with your books in very very few locations in very small quantities because that's there is either a lack of demand or where your demand is. Yeah. I mean, most bookstores, because of the nature of a bookstore, they can't do they can't do print print on demand. Um, there is actually there is a, there are these new espresso book machines that are popping up uh, in the US where people actually can get a copy of a book printed off for them. Uh, but they tend to be appearing in like some of these coffee stores and things. Um, they may have them in the Amazon bookstores. I don't know. Mm. So it could be that like in 20 years time, um, the book copies that you see on the shelves are just for display purposes. And then you go down the back and you hear a big clanking noise as they're printing off the book for you. Um, but as things stand at the moment, if you want your book available in bookstores, you need to go with, so uh, you need to go with an option where you can actually print books and have them orderable by bookstores. Now, that can be a print-on-demand solution like Ingram Spark, um, but you, you kind of need to – they will order books, and they will, if they don't sell, they will return them to you, potentially, or they will destroy them. So it's a very different marketplace in bookstores as opposed to just ordering a book on Amazon, for example. Mm. And I guess – is it? Am I, would I be right in saying that um... – for self, for first-time publishers or less well-known authors, it's probably not even worth going down that route potentially because they wouldn't touch it. Because there, I guess there is, and this is part of the reason I did my crowdfunding campaign to try and show that there is validity in the idea. And I guess if you're a first-time author or someone who's got quite a niche thing, they, they're not probably not even going to be that interested in you because you haven't got that wealth of either experience, knowledge, audience, or proof that you can actually sell enough books for them to actually meet the demands that they require yeah i mean there is that i mean um the big disadvantage is i don't know how we ended up talking about bookstores so much clearly on my mind but the the, the reason why the big traditional publishers still have an advantage with bookstores is because you are in effect trying to sell your book to the bookstores so that they can stock it and then sell it. So you're right. As a first-time author, you might be able to go into your local bookstore and beg them to order it and get a few copies. And if you've got a relationship with the person there, then they may stock it for a while because they want to shut you up. <laughs> but um, the big traditional publishing companies have people who talk to the book chains and they're like, even they've got their series of books that they're trying to get shelf space for. Uh, for selling the books so you are competing against the traditional publishing companies uh, when you are trying to get bookstore distribution but quite honestly from apart from the cachet of appearing in a bookstore um, and it's relatively easy to be able to order a book in a bookstore I think this is what uh, somebody was saying Pat Flynn asked all of his listeners to go around Barnes and Noble and asked to order his book because uh, I think he made it available in Ingram Spark for order. But if you actually want to get your books stocked in bookstores, um, you are kind of—I mean—you earn so little money from a bookstore sale as compared to on Amazon or as an ebook. And the reason for that is that typically a bookstore will take like fifty to fifty-five percent of the value of your book just for like stocking it. So. That's not covering the cost of printing the book or any other profit margins or anything like that. So you're automatically losing half your revenue from the book because it's the bookstores taking that. And that's because it's an expensive business stocking books and money in a bookstore. I don't uh, in any way belittle. I mean, bookstores is a very labor intensive and time intensive industry and this is why Amazon has been so successful is because um, the, the author is the, cutting out the middleman of the bookstore actually saves a lot of money for both Amazon to take as profit and for the, for the self-publisher or publisher to take as money. So that's why it's 
books selling in bookstores sounds lovely but actually isn't really particularly profitable for anybody really at the end of the time yeah and i think even if you're again we said right at the start of the podcast even most people now aren't in aren't in publishing or writing a book because they really want to make money it's about just having the availability and the show authority and i guess this is where it's an interesting one i know this is something that you also have a really big opinion on tim <laughs> and it's about sort of self-publishing companies so if we sort of go back to sort of what the start of, that we talked about at the start of the show we're going actually more and more people are interested in self-publishing as a way of building authority building credibility on a topic and actually showing that this is what i am the author of this book i, I can talk about this this is a way of whatever it is whether it's to sell more courses get more speaking gigs just generally get more linkedin connections whatever it is um, but then there's a lot of people out there now that uh, run these self-publishing companies. I know since I've said that I am going to be probably looking at self-publishing a book, I've been inundated with emails and messages from people who run self-publishing companies. Now, is this a way of, you think that is a good way of people getting out there in the market? Or is it something that actually, you know what, they are a company, yes, they probably do good stuff, but actually they don't add and they do or don't add enough value to really make it worth your time, if that makes sense. Does the cost of going with one of these self publishing companies really make it worth the effort? Because you still have to give away a lot of money and it still costs yeah. a lot of money to self publish. Yeah, well, I mean, there are a lot of, let's say, not very good value self publishing companies out there. Uh, I think a lot of the very worst examples are starting to wane. There was actually one company uh, who I won't mention because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> but there was one company that was basically... Because there was a long tradition of, of what was called vanity presses, where this was before the days of print on demand and before self-publishing was kind of a serious thing, who would print off, provide services to print off a copy of books to people and send them to them to keep in their garage or whatever uh, and a lot of them transferred over to the new self-publishing world and they overcharge for things like marketing so they'll, they'll charge like 500 pounds for sending out a press release for the book which is total utter waste of money um, and so and there were an awful lot of people who jumped on the self-publishing bandwagon because um, <laughs> they've tried to self-publish books in a similar way, and I've done that. I mean, everybody kind of realizes that books, books are not necessarily, certainly on the non-fiction side, are not necessarily a massive money fountain that perhaps that some people would like to present them as being. So there is a massively variable amount of quality in terms of self-publishing companies. It's, it's kind of the the example or the analogy. I, I never know when analogies, metaphors, and like. But the analogy I'm going to use. <laughs> is like let's say you wanted to build an extension on your house um i presume you've got a house if you or if you've got a flat then it'd be a bit you i don't know yeah you need a bit of building work done <laughs> now there are there are a couple of ways you can do this you can reach out to a building company and they will have like a project manager and he will do all of the kind of arranging of like getting the carpenter in and getting like the plumber in and get the electrician in and organizing all the project now a lot of these self-publishing company what a good self-publishing company should be is like that project manager um the kind of self-publishing that i have done is like where i am in effect doing the project management myself so I'm getting the electrician in, who's the equivalent to the editor. I'm getting the plumber in, who's the equivalent to the cover designer. And I'm trying to make sure that everything's all synced up and like everything happens at the right time. And these, a lot of these self-publishing companies are the equivalent of that project manager. The trouble is a lot of them, where they, some of them source um, like their workmen from very like low quality places, let's say. So rather than like getting a good editor in, they'll get somebody they found on Fiverr or whatever, or some some guy whose English isn't actually very good. So that, that's kind of my point. It's not that all self-publishing companies are bad, because they're not. There are some very good people out there, but you do have to do your due diligence in terms yeah. of 
not just do you like the person, but are they willing to give like references and tell you what books they've helped people create before? Um, and ask, or oh, also go on to Google and type like name of the publishing company and scam and see if there's any comments. Um, I mean, any any business is going to have some unsatisfied people. Uh, so it's not a case that if you see one story that somebody really didn't like that company, that that's a bad company. But it's certainly a warning sign. Uh, if you see like loads of criticism about a particular company name, then you know that's probably not the one you want to be going with. Um, but there are an awful lot of services where you can find it's like this company called Readsy, which is a directory of editors and cover designers. And these are all like former, well, a lot of them, because of the nature of the publishing industry, a lot of publishing companies are using freelance staff for doing editing and cover design. So it's exactly the same people that would be doing it for a traditional publishing company. It's just a case that you're rather than using a self-publishing company or going with a traditional publisher where they're going to hire these people, you're hiring them directly. So it would be the same if you found out who the best plumber was and the best electrician in in Wales was, and then they were doing your house. Uh, that is the same as using a service like Reedsy or going from recommendations of people who are actually work for traditional publishers. Um, because a lot of those staff are now freelancers. They're not working in-house at uh, publishers anymore. So you can hire exactly the same people to create, help create your book as would be in a traditional publisher. Mm, yeah, no, that 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 makes a lot of sense. And I guess, again, it's like with any business, isn't it? There's so many pros and cons. And I love that analogy of where you looked at the project management because yeah. this is essentially what I'm now weighing up my options of is whether I'd potentially go with a self-publishing company, whether I go by myself or not. And I see a lot of pros and cons, and I agree with you. Some of the... I do agree that a lot of the ones that I've seen so far, they seem to overcharge for a lot of stuff that aren't their specialty. I don't know if it's because they have to get people in or not, but I looked at one company and they basically charged a normal fee. I think it must have been about I mean, probably a total of $1,400, maybe $1,300, and that was basically to get the book. Um, it was copy edited, in, internal formatting, printing, all that, that the sort of basic stuff that you need for a book. And the next tier up, it took it to like something like $2,400. And that was for things like to create a promotional video, um, to, to do some press release and stuff. And I looked at this and I was like, that video was pretty much, I could get that done on Fiverr. And I can get a few of the <laughs> other bits done. And I'm like... But I could, but then I looked at some of the quality of their books. I was like, oh, okay, actually, I can see. And I look at some of the other people that have referred to them. I'd heard of one or two of them, and I was like, oh, okay, that looks promising in terms of the actual publishing. But like all the bits that aren't associated with book writing, I was like, it just it just seems well overpriced. And this wasn't. Uh, I'm not gonna like have a go at this one company because it seemed like there were a number of companies there, and it seems to really. I was gonna try and challenge you about something like that on this, Tim, and try and sort of have like a little sort of fisticuff fight. But I'm actually finding myself annoyingly agreeing with you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the trouble with anything is that labour is expensive. Uh, my, my old economics hat, I did an economics degree many, many years ago. I ended up in IT and now I've ended up in sort of self-publishing and social media stuff. But um, the, the point is that it's like labour is expensive. So if you've got another person doing the project management side of things, uh, chances are they're going to outsource it to somebody and then they want to take their cut on top of it. Um, so unless the company is really huge... Uh, in which case you, you're you going to get a very sort of cookie-cutter kind of approach. They're making a large amount of their money from the cut that they make from you over and above the cost of the services that they're providing. So it, it's kind of like if you're cutting out the middleman and you're finding the best editors, uh, I mean, it is, it, I mean, it's intimidating uh, to, to start self-publishing because... You worry about, like, well, am I going to get the right editor or am I going to cover design? Am I going to screw up with the formatting? And I've basically done all of these <laughs> at some stage or other. Um, but I always suggest to people start with a smallish project um, 
uh, you probably uh, it's probably too late for you now, but um, <laughs> maybe start with like if you've got a real like a real book that you really want to write, uh, maybe don't start with that. Start with another project. Learn the ropes of how to manage a self-publishing project and do it yourself. I mean, there are programs out there that can do a really good job of formatting the book. I, I was talking to you about this uh, product called Vellum which I've not actually used myself, but I heard so many good things about it. I haven't used it because it's a Mac product, and uh, I'm a PC guy. Oh, um, boo. <laughs> um, but even like software like Scrivener, which is like uh, about 40 or 50 pounds, uh, that can produce a decent quality ebook for you out the back of it. So if you're, t- if you're paying somebody to format your book for you, you want them to be doing a really good job. It's, uh, it's much more of a thing that's important for a paperback book. Um, there is a difference in that ebooks are more like a packaged up website than they are a like so the formatting is not you you don't worry about fonts and you don't worry about where things are placed on an ebook because it's like a website now that has other considerations because you know there are ugly websites and like ugly websites there are ugly ebooks <laughs> Um, but you can, there's like a, there's a free KDP uh, Kindle direct publishing program that you can download and it will, it will show you how it looks on particular devices. So before you actually create the ebook, you can check that it doesn't look terrible. Um, now, paperback formatting, there's all sorts of rules and like traditions that are done in publishing about how the books are laid down. But the easiest way is just to find some books that you've got from traditional publishers that you really like, similar to your book. And just check that you've formatted yours the same as that. Uh, so like having a blank, they always start on the right, for example, and the page number in this, they don't have a page number on particular pages and things like that. So all of this can be done yourself. But in effect, you're, you're cutting out um, the cost of these extra services by doing it yourself. So you're doing the time of project managing the book yourself. So if time is important to you, so, I mean, yeah, like the, the Ben Roberts empire, uh, if, you, if the time of managing the project is too much, then that's where these services can make a difference. But you need to spend time actually finding the right self-publishing service for you, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I guess what it is, time, time is money, isn't it, I guess? The yeah. more time you spend having to project manage means less time potentially writing and it means actually look it's the cost of what your time is an hour versus the cost of outsourcing I think if the cost of outsourcing it to get the same quality it equals say 20 30 pound an hour but you charge yourself out for 40 50 pound an hour then you'd argue that it's pretty better to work, go with these one of these self-publishing companies because actually you're still getting better value from it than it, you having to spend the time on it yourself oh yeah um i mean there are self-publishing companies which are really like parts of small presses. So uh, I, I can't remember if it's called Matador, if it's called Troubadour, but there's, <laughs> there's either a small publishing house called Troubadour. I think it's called Troubadour, and the self-publishing service they provide is called Matador. And they basically just run you through exactly the same services they use for their traditionally published things. They've just got a self-publishing service. So they could potentially put your book up as a small press, or they could, or you could pay and do. Now they tend to be on the more expensive side of these self-publishing companies, but you know that you're going to get a decent quality of sort of editing, cover design, because that's kind of what they do all the time anyway. Um, there are a lot of people who have self-published a book and then decide that they want to teach other people how to self-publish books well not teach but actually self-publish books for other people because they see like oh i've got a skill what can i do i've self-published book i'll help other people self-publish book and a lot of the time it's not that they're bad people it's just that they they will do it to the level of what they did their book to and that may not necessarily be the best standard as compared to uh what you can get out there in the marketplace they will be using editors they you know, they may even have an in-house editor, but you are very limited to kind of the quality levels that they are used to. So there is a very much a you get what you pay for, but on the other hand, you need to do your research because I think there is a lot of variability. There are some people who are in the self-publishing space who, let's say, are much better at marketing themselves 
than actually providing the self-publishing services. Mm. Yeah, and then that's the thing, isn't it? It's all about trying to find that validity and that that what what you need versus what you want. I think it's always tough. I think it's the same with any business, isn't it? Sometimes you have to spend actually so much time validating the potential people to work with. It it, it becomes quite a, a almost like its own project in itself before you've even got to the writing side of things. Yeah, and it's interesting. Um, I had this discussion. I think it's actually one of the interviews that appears in my book, which I'm doing about people networking on social media. And somebody made the very good point that just because you see somebody mentioned a lot on social media or you see their name or you ask for recommendations and like, oh, I want somebody to help me self-publish my book. Uh, a lot of the people, a lot of the recommendations are almost secondhand. I mean, you might recommend me for self-publishing services and yet – it's like, well, you've not actually used me directly in self-publishing services, but you listen to my podcast, you know. So it's quite difficult with recommendations because a lot of it is somebody would have heard a name somewhere uh, and they may be somebody who speaks on stage about a particular subject or a particular activity, but they really haven't got the, the level of – you want to find the people who've actually used the services or, or know the people – because those are the those are the useful recommendations. You don't want just because somebody's heard of a particular person, but hasn't used their service. They've just met them at a conference or whatever. That's the level of recommendations you're looking for. Um, it's very much. It is very very much like building hiring builders to be uh, to work on your house. It's kind of like you, it's very hard to kind of get that judge right. A lot of it's gut instinct, but you do want to do the research in terms of. Is this person right for me or should I be doing it myself? Uh, should I be going for a traditional publisher? Um, there are cases where if you're writing, say, a literary fiction book or poetry or something like that, where you're never, ever going to make your money back. <laughs> yeah. Where actually going with a traditional publisher is a good idea. But I think for most marketers and most people trying to use it as a, a way of getting kind of a, almost a business card self-publishing makes a lot of sense so of course if you can get a traditional publisher to do it for you and not have to pay anything then you could argue that that's that's a good decision for some marketers as well yeah no i think it's a it's a really interesting thing. i mean that with with a lot of art stuff if you can you try and find someone who can uh who can pay for it for you because you know likelihood is you're not gonna make any money till you're dead sorry <laughs> sorry sorry art people who are listening but it it is it's one of those one of those things the way it seems to be isn't it that actually from art and poetry and stuff a lot of people don't make money until years after i mean, i'm reading a book called um the perennial seller at the moment have you read it no, I haven't. And it's a really interesting book, and it looks at sort of the lifetime value of things. Just say, just because something doesn't sell a huge amount at the start, it actually becomes a life lifelong seller. So, for example, and um, the the one of the examples was the Shawshank Redemption. As a film, it, yeah. in the cinema, it it didn't do anything. It went straight out. It, it sort of didn't make any money. But then over time, it's gathered more and more fans. It's become this cult cult thing and it talks about some of the books in, in in the examples um and sort of iron maiden for example i think so that they 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 actually sell more stuff now than they ever have done and it's just it's like these little things that keep going and going and actually how things doesn't have to sell a huge amount of books straight away but actually if you didn't have that backing to start with then it won't become a perennial seller and it was it's a really interesting book i definitely recommend that to people who are listening right, right now well, I mean, this is this is the thing about uh, self-publishing where there's an advantage of a traditional publishing, as in you own all the rights to all the books that you self-publish. And you are, in effect, in effect creating a amount of passive income coming in. Now, the problem with marketing and a lot of non-fiction books is they do date. So... Maybe what will be the marketing buzz buzzwords in 50 years' time may be quite different from what they are now. But if you create your – so you're creating your marketing buzzword book, you may sell like hardly any copies in the next year or so. But then because your career in marketing is taking off and like suddenly you get some enormous like 
super marketing world conference that suddenly appears in London or whatever, uh, and you become the lead head speaker, everybody in the room goes out after you, you speak and buys your book. Suddenly your book starts to make money in the future um, because it's associated with you. So the people who make are making money out of books are generally speaking, and this is more true on the fiction side, but it's also some non-fiction writers are doing this. People who are consistently producing books, like one or two, like a book every month or a book every two or three months. They've almost got like an industrial because they know that each one of these books is a potential sale at some point in the future. And if one of those books takes off, then people will go back and buy all of their back catalogue or a large chunk of it. So having a book is a way to have the potential to make a lot of money in the future, uh, even if it doesn't sell now, even if it's a total flop at, the, at this time. Because you own the rights to it, you're not going to take it, not like a traditional publisher will take it all out of print. Your book can stay available as an ebook on a, and on Amazon indefinitely. So if your business takes off and you get some fame or like you write another book that's successful or, or your podcast suddenly takes off, then you've got these potential sources of income that are out there just to um, help you amplify your success in the future. Mm. I think that's a I think it's a really nice way of putting it actually is a a book is for life, not just for Christmas. So yes it's hard graph to put in there. And it is though, isn't it? It it, it a book doesn't just disappear, especially a physical paperback book. Once it's out there in the wild, it, people will pass it from people to people as well. And more people will remember your name and you will keep it's one of those things that people do keep buying them. It's not a it's not like something that just disappears after a month or so. It's something that you can always have. You own the rights to. It's your name on the your name above the door and as long as you're, you still work in that industry, or even if you don't work in that industry, it's something that you've done. It's like a like a portfolio of your work, isn't it? it, it it's, it's proof that you have been there and done something which other people don't have. Yeah, and um, I, I, I kind of ended up on a tangent there, but I was going to talk about rights in general. Um, this is a very specific thing for any media, but it's particularly true for, for books. So... If you create your book, um, your buzzword book, somebody who is based in Korea may really like your book but want to translate it into Korean. And they may approach you to buy the Korean language rights for that book of you. So you've, you've got, like, there are rights to your book in every single language in the world, every single territory in the world, there's like audio book rights. There's, I mean, it's obviously ebook rights and paperback rights. You could sell the paperback rights to sell your book in Australia to an Australian publisher. So those rights are valuable. Um, and if you're going with a traditional publisher, they have those rights. So you get paid royalties if you're a traditionally published author, but you don't have access to sell the audio book rights to your marketing buzzword thing to somebody in Germany, for example. But as a self-publisher, you do. So there's a whole slew of rights and things that are available to self-publishers that aren't to people who've been traditionally published. So that's where being the, the owner and project manager makes a big difference. Yeah, no, definitely. Again, having that, that control, I think, is, is is a hugely important thing. I think it's from sort of summarising sort of what we've talked about in this show. I mean, it's been a little bit sort of different to many other episodes I've done, I guess, because we talked a lot about marketing stuff and how how everything is based around marketing. And this is a little bit different in terms of this has gone into the historical stuff around something and why is something is important. Now and I've really I've really enjoyed it, Tim, and this is sort of perfect for one to get you on because the the history, the knowledge and the ideas, even if you are a bit cynical as we as, as we all know you know you and love you for, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> it it is. It's it's really important that people understand actually some of the differences. And it's not knocking traditional publishing because it still it massively has its place. But if yeah. you are just looking for certain things, it it may not be right for you then. And same with anything, you have to take that time to check the validity of it just because just because it sounds good it sounds like sounds like a great idea to be featured by one of these publishers doesn't mean it's actually going to be anything any beneficial more beneficial for your company you just lose a lot of control and you lose a lot of potential future income whereas 
with self-publishing, you have that full control, and it, it sticks one half of dozen of the other in terms of w- your preference and what you want to and what you want to do. Yeah, exactly. Hey, perfect. Thanks so much for coming on today, Tim. It's been an absolute blast. However, before I let you go, I need to ask you the same question that I ask everyone else when I finish up an episode: is Tim, what are the marketing buzzwords out there right now? Are you loving or hating? What is really grinding your gears and making you go, ah, I hate this so much, I wish people would stop talking about it? Or something you would go, ooh, you know what? I really like that. I believe in that. And I think that's going to be potentially the next big thing. Um, the trouble is I'm thinking, like, who do, who do I not want to offend by, <laughs> <laughs> by saying that? Um in terms of the next Tim, big Tim, thing, I Tim, think... it's a safe place here. It's a safe place. Yes. Have, I, have I got a safe word I can use? To sort of <laughs> right, and just beep out that bit of the podcast. <laughs> and I particularly don't like beep and then beep. Um, something which I think... Let's start with the positive. Something I think that is the way that marketing is going is more the relationship marketing kind of Jessica Phillips kind of way of doing things as opposed to the much more transactional way things are, are going uh, like in the past. So I think building relationships with people is the way that marketing needs to be done. And it's not just because I'm writing a book about a very similar topic. <laughs> um, but, I mean, this is one of the things why I've got so interested in marketing and social media is because it's quite hard to actually sell books. Um, books are low-value items, um, and there's a lot of competition to sell books. So that's kind of, in my experience, in trying to work out how to become good at selling books, which I'm still on that journey, to be fair, um, I, I have seen that it's the longer-term relationship marketing approaches work a lot better. Um, in terms of a buzzword that I know somebody who I do really like uses a lot, which is like, well, there's a few people like... So be yourself and be social and be human. And I, I appreciate all of those kind of expressions, but it's just the lack of clarity of what does it mean? Mm. <laughs> uh, if you, It's just be yourself. Well, I am myself. What, what do I need to do? I, I, I don't think it's a bad expressions. It's just I think they need a bit more clarity as to what they actually mean. Yeah, it's not, um, it's not, it's not explanatory, is it? It just says, it says be you, okay? That's who I am. Where does that go next? What? What? Where do we go from yeah, there? If you, and if you're not a nice person, then maybe you shouldn't be you. <laughs> um, and there are lots and lots of nice people who are themselves and don't have any success. So it, it's not that I think. I mean, there is a. I think there is a lot to be said for authenticity, um, and being more well, not vulnerable but open, open to being sort of. Because if you never do anything... Uh, More exposed, uh, you, I guess. Yeah. If you never do anything where you could risk something, then you're never going to have any success. And that's as true with marketing as it is with anything else. Uh, so don't just copy what everybody else does. Um, I, I think that is the essence of what be yourself means. It's like, don't copy everybody else. Do something that's original that you've thought of. Uh, but it's not quite the same as just be yourself because you may be quite boring. And you may have to step out of your boring world and associate with some more interesting things and, and stop copying other people all the time. Uh, <laughs> I suppose that's probably what I would interpret it means. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I think there's a there's a lot to be said. And hopefully you'll find out a lot more about this in my book, which is coming next year now. Ooh. Mm. But it is, though. It's one of the sections I'm talking about in there is actually... How you, you if you're going to be talking about something, it's be quite clear in in terms of defining what it is yeah. you stand for, what it is you're actually trying to teach people. Well, instead of just saying a couple of words, it's actually teaching people about it. What does it mean? So when people see those words, how do they associate it across your teachings, your brand, your experiences, the way you portray yourself and having sort of that common thread again for a personal brand or as a business brand. If a business brand starts saying a couple of words, what does it actually mean? Are they clarifying that? Are they making it simple? And it says it sounds harsh, but it's treat people like they're simple, like they don't understand because assume everyone's got a low base and then you can work up from there. If you start treating, if you start somewhere higher up, chances are you're alienating a lot of people. 
Yeah. And the other thing, um, coming as a non, totally non-marketing person into kind of being exposed to a lot of marketing people at conferences, and I love marketing, going to marketing conferences, uh, and I love marketers in general, actually. But the whole industry seems to be in a bit of a, a movement from traditional marketing where it was about sort of, and the communication side, there was like people creating billboards and nobody really knew what worked, uh, not in the specific case, uh, where you move into digital marketing where you ha often have a much better idea about like how many clicks a particular Facebook advert got or how many sales you got through a particular Google ad. So there is much more uh, measurability. But on the other hand, there is still a lot of marketing which isn't that tangible. Uh, and that's the all the relationship and uh, community building side. Um, but I think relation, uh, marketing is struggling with this transition from where a lot of it was just basically let's throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks uh, to where there is much more measurability um, but there was, I think it's flipped. Sometimes it's flipped too far in the other direction, where it's almost like everything has to be measured and everything has to be by those results or metrics of some kind, um, which misses out the the bit which isn't measurable anymore, even even now. Um, so as an outsider coming into marketing, it's I think marketing is struggling with that kind of are we talking about return on investment and we're very sort of like analytical or are we all talking about the fluffy kind of like humanity side of marketing or are we sort of like talking about digital billboards or are we talking about targeted ads to specific personas? Uh, it, it, it's in a bit of a state of flux at the moment. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I agree on that. I think there's, there is, there's a lot of flux. I'm trying to, Think about it, my mind is going in all sorts of different directions, Tim. And I don't know. I don't know where to. Don't know where to go from here. I'm just. You know. I'm. I'm now in a state of flux. <laughs> well, you. I mean, we had a conversation in San Diego where you pointed at a billboard in a baseball stadium and you said, "What is the ROI of yeah. having an ad on that billboard?" And the simple answer is, nobody knows. Really, at the end of the day, I mean, you could do a survey of people in the basketball stadium and say, how many people saw the ad for Ben Roberts' book? <laughs> uh, and you get an, uh, you could approximate it a bit, but it's like there could have been somebody driving past the stadium who looked up and saw the advert and then suddenly decided they want to rush out and buy it. And you had no idea about that. Or it could be that somebody in the stadium, only one person in the stadium saw it, but they were somebody who was like an international sort of DJ, uh, DJ and they mentioned your book on their show, and suddenly you get a vast amount of sales. And all of this kind of stuff is very kind of intangible and hard to measure. Um, but I think I think marketers should be attempting to measure as much as they can, not as like you're never going to get it precise, but it will give mm. you some idea. Because it could be that marketing... You, using billboard advertising as basically not very good value compared to say a Facebook ad for example mm. is I think measurements but it, it is easier than it ever ever has been it's just going to be one of those yeah it, it's just one of the things is how far do you go measuring everything uh, so I did another interview which is coming up just before this one which is about company culture and measuring the value of culture I think it's going to be if we're, in, we're living a fascinating time Tim we're fascinating yeah hey Thank you so much for coming on today, Tim. It's been an absolute blast, mate, and I've learned so much, as I do all the time, about self-publishing, and um, I'm so glad I got you on to talk about it. Well, it's been great to be on your show, and uh, can I plug my own Begin Self-Publishing podcast at the end of your show as well? <laughs> oh, of course, mate, of course. Yeah, so my, my show is the Begin Self-Publishing podcast, which you can probably find on all the same great outlet distributors that have this podcast on so apple spotify etc so uh that's about all about self-publishing so uh, and you'd be what, my show. 100 and how many episodes now is it tim 120 something 134 i think yeah yeah and that's what it actually what is while i was on the plane actually i was in south of france last week i listened to tim's five part quick part uh five part quick guide to self publishing as well so if you are interested check out those sort of five five or six episodes is it six, six. in the end yeah 
yeah, have a look, listen to those. And they're really interesting, sort of like little sort of six, seven minutes, little bite sized stuff. Check those out. They're really sort of a good little read. Yeah. Well, I listen, mean, I did listen. <laughs> yeah, I did the whole. I did those when I started the podcast like two and a bit years ago. I did like this is a guide to self publishing. And then I ended up interviewing loads of marketers and other people about various aspects of self publishing as like an interview. So I thought I'd do the the quick guide just for people who'd come to the show later and wanted a because it all needed to be up, updated. Everything changes over time, uh, both in my experience and like in terms of what what is available in self publishing. So that's why I did that quick guide. Uh, now I'm going to be moving more towards helping people to self-publishers and interviewing them along their process. So that's a change in the focus of the show. But there's also a load of great interviews in marketers back if anybody's interested in that with a more self-publishing focus. Mm, definitely, definitely. Thanks so much again, Tim, mate. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ben. Yes. I... Every time I have a conversation with Tim, and we've talked self-publishing before, and we've talked about books us for, but every time I have a conversation with him, I'm learning something new, and I love the way he thinks about how to use, whether you go self-publishing, or whether you go down a traditional publishing routes, and the options there, and actually the way that the the world of publishing is going, and actually how you can use it to your advantage. I mean, for me now, I'm looking at going down the self-publishing route, and it's actually, it's thanks to Tim and some of his advice, and I've learned a heck of a lot from his Begin Self-Publishing podcast as well. So I know we wasn't strictly maybe dissecting a buzzword as much as we normally do, but I think there you can all agree there is something really interesting about the world of publishing in terms of helping it to build on authority and build credibility on a subject. And this is what it's all feeding into what I'm trying to create now with this marketing buzzword podcast, the project, the book, and all these different phases of the project that I'm having. So really excited about that and i absolutely can't can't wait for you to listen i can't wait to hear your feedback on this episode of tim and then we'll be back on thursday with another bite-sized buzzword and i can't believe we're over 50 episodes now this is absolutely ridiculous thank you so much for tuning in and please share it with your friends if if you're if you're liking it or share it with anyone that you know that likes marketing thank you very much until next time goodbye this podcast is part of the you are the media network 